Well, we're going through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and this is our third week, and we are in the second chapter. And if you want to kind of track along, most of these passages will be on uh, the screen, but I, there's usually some Bibles close to you on the floor in a chair. It's on page 870, 1 Corinthians. We'll be in the second chapter today. And I want to give you the boring part first. Um, this is also a very important part, I think, today. A little background on what's going on here. Um, you, I, I think it's important to understand what's been going on in Paul's life leading up to this. Um, what he, he had been experiencing, I think, makes uh, this passage today really come to life. It did for me anyway. Paul's been an apostle for 16 years when this takes place, so he's not a newcomer at this. And he'd had a lot of success, and he'd had a few failures. Um, we learn in Acts 17, which is kind of the New Testament's history book that tells the travels of Paul predominantly, um, how he went to preach to the Jews and also to the Gentiles, and he went into what was then Macedonia. Uh, today, most of it is Greece. And there were some conversions in the cities that he went to, um, but there's also some problems. He went to this town called Thessalonica. Uh, we get the book Thessalonians when Paul wrote to them. And he had some conversions there, but some of the Jews got really upset, and he had to leave in the middle of the night to save his life. And he went to Berea, Greece, not Kentucky. Okay, And when he, when he went there, the same thing happened. He had a few conversions. But also these guys from Thessalonica followed him over there, and he had to leave to save his life. So then he went to Athens, not Athens, Athens, okay? And when he got to Athens, you know, Athens was kind of the cultural center of the Western world at that time. And, and they uh, had guys like, you know, some of their patron saints, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. You know, this is like... Uh, Harvard or Oxford is what this was, was a, what, to go to Athens. And, and when he went there, um, he didn't do so well. He stood there in the forum and he kind of debated some of these philosophers. And uh, he sounded really eloquent. You read it in Acts. And, I mean, he sounds really good. You go, man, that's a good argument, Paul. But they laugh at him. They laugh at him. And he leaves with just a few conversions and, of course, we have no letter of Paul to the church at Athens because, as far as we know, there's no church that starts there. And so he goes from there, from Athens, down to Corinth. And at Corinth, we see when he arrives there, he has a totally different method of uh, preaching the gospel. And this, this city of Corinth is a, a city that's known in its, in its place for uh, being a city of sin. Man, you could do anything there. I mean, they had it all. But it was also a very industrious city. This is where entrepreneurs went. If you wanted to get ahead, you went to Corinth. It was a really fast-growing city, big city of commerce. And so when he got there, he went and he started preaching to the Jewish people first, which is what he, he, he uh, normally does. But he also, instead of just being the preacher and the evangelist, he, he makes tents wise there. And Paul is a tent maker. And in those days, they made tents out of leather. I mean, that, that's, that's a heavy tent to backpack with, a leather tent. But it was a noble trade, and so he comes to him, and what he does is he kind of reduces himself. He doesn't come in as Paul the Apostle, sent by Jesus to preach to you, now listen to my message, but he comes in, he makes tents, and he mingles with them, and to tries a totally different approach. And he doesn't arrive as this great orator or this debater. He he isn't preacher Paul at all. He's tent maker Paul who happens to know Jesus. That's who he comes to him as. And he stayed there a year and a half, and he's got great success. But the success has nothing to do with Paul. It has nothing to do with his ability to preach or teach or persuade anybody. You see? It's, it's not that at all. The success is all about God. And, and Paul, as I would say, just kind of gets out of the way and lets God. So here we are. 1 Corinthians 2. Um, begin with the first verse. He says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come preaching God's secrets to you like I was an expert in speech or wisdom. I had made up my mind not to think about anything while I was with you except Jesus Christ. 
and to preach him as crucified. I stood in front of you with weakness, fear, and a lot of shaking. My message and my preaching weren't presented with conv convincing words, wise words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul says when he first came to Corinth, he, he wasn't slick, he's not eloquent, he's not polished, he's not professional. He's exactly the opposite of that. He says, I came in weakness, and my weaknesses were exposed to you. I mean, he didn't fake it. He didn't come as, you know, the top guy. He didn't drop names to try to impress people. You know how to do that, don't you? We all know how to do that, how to drop names, try to impress people. Um, faking it really is a pretty normal thing for a person to do. We each, no matter uh, what our vocation, have a way of letting people know who we are and just how important we are, don't we? Aren't you able to do that? Let people know just who you know and drop a celebrity name or an achievement someplace. And It's the old, as we say back on the farm, it's the old pecking order thing. The pecking order is a metaphor that comes from the farm culture, and it comes from chickens. And a chicken will peck on another chicken, and that chicken will peck on another chicken, and that chicken will peck on another chicken. There's only one chicken in the whole roost that doesn't get pecked on. That's the top chicken. Every other chicken gets pecked on, and they know what other chickens they can peck on. Yeah, there's a system. Chickens have got a system. And we kind of know that system, too, as to... Uh, where we rank with other people, you know, and uh, of course we're always trying to get a better ranking, so, you know, we've got a better chicken pecking on us, is how it goes, right? We all know how to do that. You, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know how women do it, I know how men do it. I'm not going to get into the woman thing on how women have a pecking order. I'm sure that you do, but I think there's a real danger zone over there. And so I'm not going to get into the pecking order of, of women. I'm just going to think about how I do it. I know how to do it. You know, uh, ministers have a pecking order, uh, no doubt about it. Um, I'll be at a conference or something and introduce myself. And what are you doing? Oh, I'm the pastor of the gathering. Really haven't heard of the gathering. Oh, yeah, the gathering is over on... Old Todd's Road. Can't even be Young Todd's Road. It's got to be over on <laughs> Old Todd. It's over there in Old Todd, you know. I said, well, I haven't seen that church. Well, we're on the second floor, you know. So there you go. I think I'm ah, starting to get pecked on here. I can feel this, right? So he says, well, it's a big church. No, it's a small church. Um, you have any staff? Well, not really, you know. Um, got myself and he says boy that's got to be hard I don't know what I would do without my assistants and my secretaries and my staff oh you know <laughs> gee oh man that hurt so you know what I come back with I go oh I know what you mean I miss my huge staff greatly and all my secretaries I really miss them but you know, I go under him. I said, but I just felt called by God to do this for Jesus. In other words, if, if you've got staff and if you've got secretaries, you're not doing it for Jesus, but I am, see. You know how to do this, right? You do it your own way. You know, everybody's got something that, you know, I know somebody. When we lived in Versailles, some of you know where we lived, and it was in a very uh, average house. It was a ball home nice house, every average house, but our backyard bordered up against a thoroughbred farm. <laughs> Bill Shatner's horses were out there in that farm. They weren't thoroughbreds, but, and we weren't for sure they were Shatner's, but we had heard that they were Shatner's. So when people said, well, where do you live? Oh, we live out in the back of, you know, right beside Shatner's horses is where we live. And, you know, peck on, the, peck on them just a little bit. And if they didn't know that you lived in Sycamore Estates, if they'd never been in Sycamore Estates, they would think that you were a pretty wealthy and important person, right? That's the way we do it. We meet somebody that we don't know, and we immediately start asserting ourselves and faking it, you know. If it's family or friends, they know who you are. You can't do anything about it. 
just got to be yourself, right? But if it's somebody that we don't know that we're trying to impress, that's what we do. Paul says, I came and stood in front of you with weakness, fear, and a lot of shaking. <laughs> Doesn't sound to me like he's much of a public speaker. But God showed up because, you see, Paul was real. He says, there was a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the demonstration of the Spirit and power? I mean, here's this very unimpressive, we do know some things about Paul. He's a very unimpressive middle-aged man who has a problem speaking, probably. He's not eloquent. Uh, he's middle-aged. He's not much to look at, they say. He doesn't come to them being this charismatic preacher, but he's the least likely guy that you think is going to be the apostle, the representative of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. And as he's talking to him, his knees are shaking, scared to death. And I got to thinking about that. Maybe inside he's thinking, man, I hope the same thing doesn't happen here as what happened at Athens. I hope these guys don't laugh at me. At least the philosophers in Athens were educated, well-respected men, and they laughed at me, and I thought I was having the, the, you know, this was the big break in life. I get to go to the forum and stand among all these educated people and speak to them about Jesus, and when I'm done, they go, <laughs> oh my, go home, Jew, talking to us about the resurrection, they say to him. And I wonder if he's standing in front of the Corinthians and he's wanting the same thing. I'm saying, you know, less of me, less of me. This, this is it, boy. He says, I, I'm not going to try to be somebody that I'm not. I'm not going to try to impress these people. I'm just going to be myself. In the year that uh, Jimmy Carter was elected president, he and Billy Graham were invited to speak at the 17,000-member convention of the Southern Baptist Church. And the first of three presenters was Billy Graham. Um, the speaker following Billy Graham was a truck driver. And, of course, um, the man uh, was not a well-educated man. He's seated there beside uh, the President of the United States in between the President and Billy Graham. And he said, uh, before he was ready to speak, he says, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can give a talk. He made his way to the microphone, they gave him a glass of water, and they said that he kind of stumbled and mumbled around after Billy Graham had given a very powerful, they only given five minutes, but a very powerful five minutes. And what he says into the microphone, he says, I was always drunk, didn't have any friends. The only people I knew were men like me who hung around the bars in the town where I lived. And the truck driver went on to talk about how Someone invi invited him and introduced him to Jesus Christ. And once he became a Christian, he wanted to tell others about the Lord, so he spent some time in Bible study with some other people and learned some things. And then he went back to the only place that he knew, those guys that he sat at the bar with every night. And he started telling them about Jesus Christ. And that didn't go over real well with the bartender. That kind of cuts down on drinks a little bit. You got some guy that's touting Jesus down the bar. But he carried on. He says, at first they treated me like a joke, but I, kept a, but I kept up with the questions. And when I couldn't answer one, I'd go back and ask one of my friends. And then I'd come back with it. And then he said, 14 of my friends became Christians. Imagine that. 14 of his friends became Christians. That's why they asked the truck driver to talk between President Carter and, and Billy Graham. 14 of his friends became Christians. Because he got out of the way and he let God do the work. You see, it wasn't about Paul. It's all about Jesus, about Jesus crucified. And when Paul became little enough, they could see Jesus. When he got out of the way, Jesus was there at Corinth and they could see him. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. And a church is born. And Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, you guys are fighting and you're in factions and you're upset with each other and cliques and let me rem remind you of how you first believed, he said, because I didn't come to you with eloquent words. He says, uh, you didn't come to faith because I was so smart or entertaining or eloquent. You came to believe in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit did the work, not me. Has that been your experience? I will just stop here for a minute right now. 
Has that been your experience? You certainly didn't come to faith because Don was so eloquent or some other preacher was so smart. Did you come to faith because the Holy Spirit has shown himself in power? Probably so. I think that Paul was not done learning. You know, we don't talk about that much. We, we just assume that an apostle knows everything. But, you know, I think he was in the process of some stuff here. And uh, I think this was his season of learning how to really get out of the way, to cease trying to impress people, even embrace his weakness so that God could do something huge. I want to read you what he wrote to him in 2 Corinthians. Most of you are familiar with this passage. This is a pretty powerful passage uh, and familiar one. Uh, I want you to hear it again in light of what we know now. It's from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. He says, I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with my weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, stressful situations, for the sake of Christ, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Like I keep saying, that could make our refrigerators, couldn't it? Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Probably needs to go on the rearview mirror in our car as we're driving to work every day to remember that when I'm weak, I'm strong. Paul learned that to fulfill the mission that God gave him, a life meant that only God can do it. And his role was to identify his weakness and to decrease so that God could increase. It's not an easy lesson. It's never an le easy lesson. I'm not sure we're ever done with this lesson. You know, actually, death is the final surrender to God. Death is the actual last time that we give up control, isn't it? I don't think we ever end this lesson. God cannot use us when we are full of ourselves. He can't fill us with the Spirit if we're full of ourselves. We, we have to decrease so that God can increase. There's, God can't use us in his power if we are filled with fear and doubt and worry. There's no short course here. This takes a while. A lot of lessons. I suspect that we're all enrolled in this school. We just might be fighting the instructor from day to day. It's about surrender. God has some big plans. I really believe this. God has some huge plans in our lives. Oh, not that we will be seen by the world to be important, but that we might make a change, perhaps, in someone else's life. That God might use us in some way, like a truck driver with his buddies. You know, God has some huge plans that can only be achieved when we decrease and God increases. And Paul says, I know. He says, I, I remember Athens. I remember what that was like. I remember re being run out of Berea and Thessalonica. And I remember the way the Spirit moved in our midst when I was with you guys at Corinth. And hundreds of lives were changed when I stopped fighting God and I just let him do it. Not every step backwards is a step backwards. Sometimes something happens to us and we think, man, that's terrible. I'm never going to recover from this. Not every step backwards is a step backwards. Your weakness in God's hands is an opportunity for God to do something great in your life. We, we try to hide our weaknesses. We try to conquer our weaknesses. We try to eliminate our weaknesses. We try to work on them. God says, you just, just watch what I can do with you, with your weakness. Watch what I can do through you. Or we say, God, bless these plans. Here's my plans. God bless these plans. And God says, your plans, I've got plans. What do you mean your plans? My plans are much bigger than your plans. <laughs> you, don't, you, you can't even get your mind around what I'm wanting to do here if you would just decrease a little bit and let me go. Just let me do this. I want to do something with your life that's much greater than your plans. Only my plans, you see, aren't about you getting strong. My plans are about you being weak enough to let me loose. 
We shouldn't be surprised if in life we come to the place where all of our resources and answers are exhausted and we have to rely on a God who raises dead people. Ever thought about that? That's who we rely on? A God that raises the dead? See, we like to put God in this nice little philosophical category with all these little sayings, and yet in the reality and the bottom line is he's a guy that raises dead people. That ought to shake us up a little bit. It ought to enlarge our plans. That's the God that we serve, the God who raises the dead. Most of the time, we act like God is tame and timid. Just, you know, he's a God who raises dead people. Our plans are too small. Our plans are always operate around our strengths. What can I do? Let me assess who I am and what I've got and see what I can do. And God says, why don't you let me do it? We don't want God showing up. We all know what this is like. The Holy Spirit's messy. The Holy Spirit does things that we don't want him to do sometimes. To people, we don't want him to do. And he's messy. He never does it the way we tell him to do it. Right? Maybe you've not seen the power of the Holy Spirit at work. I don't know. I think you have. So if we surrender to God and we say, God, use me in some way, we shouldn't be surprised if we come to the end of our resources and have to depend on a God who raises the dead. Okay, that's four verses out of 16. We better get going. Verse 5. I did this so that your faith might not depend on the wisdom of people, but on the power of God. There's the motivation. See, I did this so you might depend on the power of God. Isn't this written to us today? I mean, it's like Paul's living in my closet. Okay, the wisdom of people is so much more manageable than the power of God. The power of God is scary and messy. God might do something that I don't think of or expect. What, what if we prayed and developed a mission in life? I mean, we have vocations, but, but your vocation probably isn't your mission. We each have a mission. Some of us are raising kids. Some of us are, are, have a friend. Some of us are, you know, somebody that encourages someone else. We all have a specific mission from God. It's, I'm not talking about your vocation at all, okay? But what if we developed our plans and our mission based on the power of God rather than just being smart or influential or connected? What if every problem that fell on us was considered to be God's problem? Did you ever think about that? Every problem we have. Some people think like this. I, it's, it's a struggle for me. Something happens bad in their life, and they go, well, there's, there's a problem for God. Let's see what he's going to do. And I'm like, oh, man, you haven't worried about that enough. You, 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 need, you need to write some plans down, okay? You need to get an action plan. And some people can just go, I don't know what God's going to do, but it's his problem. It's not my problem anymore. What if every problem that fell we considered to be a door for the Holy Spirit to come into our life, rather to be something that we might consider that we messed up or that we failed? God has the same desire for us that he did for the Corinthians, that we would depend on the power of God rather than the wisdom of the world. Okay, Paul then teaches the Corinthians and us what real wisdom is. Nothing to do with how smart you are or how large your vocabulary is. It has nothing to do with how many degrees you have. Let, let, let's go on here. Verse 6. He says, What we say is wisdom to people who are mature. It isn't a wisdom that comes from the present day or from today's leaders who are being reduced to nothing. We talk about God's wisdom, which has been hidden as a secret. God determined this wisdom in advance before time began for our glory. It's a wisdom that none of the present day rulers have understood because if they did understand it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. But this is precisely what is written. God has prepared the things for those who love him that no eye has seen or ear has heard or that haven't crossed the mind of any human being. Paul says real wisdom, the wisdom of God, has been there from the very beginning. And God has prepared things for us, spiritual blessings, that are so great that no one can imagine them. Then verse 10, he says, God has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, including the depths of God. Who knows a person's depths except their own spirit that lives in them? 
In the same way, no one has known the depths of God except God's Spirit. In verse 12, we haven't received the world's Spirit, but God's Spirit, so that we can know the things given to us by God. These are the things we are talking about, not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the Spirit. We are interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people. Verse 14, but people who are unspiritual don't accept the things from God's Spirit. They are foolishness to them and can't be understood because they can only be comprehended in a spiritual way. Spiritual people comprehend everything, but they themselves aren't understood by anyone. Boy, can you say amen to that. And verse 16, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who will advise him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, the word spiritual is used in there a lot, okay? And, and it's a real hot word today. I mean, there's so many different kinds of spiritual in our world today. It uh, means a lot of things used in our culture. It's a, it's a generic term. Uh, used to describe a Catholic priest, uh, going to church, uh, a synagogue, uh, a Muslim cleric. Um, maybe for others we might say somebody's very spirit spiritual because uh, they, they meditate or they, they do yoga or they burn incense in their room or they take long walks or something. We just say, oh, she's really very spiritual, has not necessarily any Christian connotation to it at all, the way that we use it in our world. And it's kind of become a generic catch-all uh, that uh, we can say spiritual and not Christ-like. What it means in our culture is to have focus on really the non-material world, and that's not what Paul is talking about here at all. When he says spiritual, in verse 12, look at that again. He says, we haven't received the world's spirit, but God's spirit, so that we can know the things given to us by God. What he's talking about is the Holy Spirit who comes and lives in every person who trusts in the person of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. And we find that we know God through and by the spirit. Now, as a human being, we each have a spirit of our, of our own. We are not just flesh and blood, but we have a spirit. That's how we communicate with God. That's how God communicates with us. As you are not just flesh and blood, but you have a spirit in you. And God reaches out to us, to our spirit, by means of his Holy Spirit. And people who do not have the Holy Spirit, they do. They think we're nuts. You know, well, I just feel God telling me that, you know, I should... Uh, give my friend $200, and they're going, what? What, God told you that? You know, they think we're crazy when, when we start talking about the Spirit instructing us and communicating with us. But to someone who has the Holy Spirit, it's as, as real as a thing as there is in this world. It's to feel that God wants you to do something. It's, it's as tangible as anything that we can touch. And debating somebody that doesn't have this knowledge it's, it's just, you never debate them into faith. You never, you never argue them into believing in Jesus Christ. You can't lay down all the logic. It's not about logic, you see. It's about the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit. Often a person with the Holy Spirit isn't even what the world would see as being spiritual. I mean, well, they go to church, but they don't meditate. You know, uh, they, uh, they don't chant, they don't do yoga, they don't burn incense, they're not spiritual at all. As a matter of fact, he talks a lot. He can't be spiritual. It has nothing to do with intelligence or philosophy or, or that stuff. Uh, it has everything to do with God. It's the power of God. Now, you need to get ready for this because the, the topic of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be visiting this topic off and on for the next 15 weeks. It's really heavy in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to learn some stuff as we go through this about the Holy Spirit. But today, I think it's important for us to know that no matter what we feel, what our reservations are about the Holy Spirit, if, if you're seeking to walk with God, you're being influenced by the Spirit. And I want to encourage you to, to speak to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is no less than God the Father, God the Son. 
And we, we have no problem praying to the Father, praying to the Son, but we never encourage the Spirit to work in our lives. I want to encourage you just to think about that and start practicing that because he's doing the work. We can't. God can. There it is in just a, two short little sentences. So today, if, if you're struggling, if you're thinking, well, you know, my life's okay except for this relationship. My life's okay for this bad problem that I've got. My life's okay except for this one thing that's going on, okay? That's where God is wanting to work in your life. That's where God is wanting to reach to you by means of his Holy Spirit. Your weaknesses, your greatest weakness that you have is God's greatest opportunity, you see. So don't kill the weakness. You know, God will overcome God, God wants to get in through that avenue. And uh, you'll find on the flip side of this a few months from now that when you look back and you say that right now, you're saying that's a terrible thing that happened to me. It, it may very well be that you'll look back on that in the future and say that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I thought it was terrible. But look at what God has done as a result of this. I never would have done, gone there had this not had happened. And it really is... I don't know if you've noticed or not, it's really been an act of the Spirit in today's service because uh, Trevor and I uh, didn't get together and pick out the songs. But have, have you heard the word surrender five or six times today already? Yes, we have. And that's really what this is about. This is about surrender. Boy, I don't like to do that. I like to negotiate. I don't like surrender. You know, I want to negotiate with God what he's going to give me and what I'm going to give up. That's not surrender. Surrender is when you just say, you get it all, okay? You, you, you are master, and that's, that's what this is about today. Set aside your answers, set aside your plans, set aside your pride. And really, I think that's what Paul was doing, was setting aside his pride. That's the hardest thing for us to do, isn't it? To say, my pride, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to become less decrease so that God can increase. Well, I want us to, to sit with this for a few minutes in prayer. As deep cries out.